Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. John, last time we spoke a lot about me and, and my origin story, and, and tonight we wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, about how you got to where you are now. I think it's fair to say that the best description of you is that you're, uh, you're a watchmaker by day and an app developer by night. Does that, that sound about right? I suppose that, that does the job. How, how does one end up in the position that you're in? Because those are two very different businesses to be in. I guess it's no different than me ending up in, in jewelry making from being in IT. But, you know, you're actively doing both of these things right now, and it, they don't seem to be interrelated. So I guess the first question is, how, how did you get into watchmaking? At what point did you make the decision that you wanted to, to start being a watchmaker? How did you go down that path and actually become one? can't pinpoint a specific point in time. It's more of an organic process, as with many things in life. And of course, there are other things running in, in parallel with, with all of that as well. To say my earliest introduction to mechanical watches occurred one afternoon when I was just a few years old. I can't remember precisely how old I was, but I was old enough that I was doing some chores around the house. And while dusting some of the things in my, my parents' bedroom, I came across a box of old watches that my father had inherited from his father. Kind of opening that box and, and winding those watches up and watching them spring to life for the first time was fascinating. And I would say then that that's when my curiosity in timepieces first took hold. A few years later, the sixth or the seventh grade, I did a project at school about Joseph Bombardier. Uh, who's a French-Canadian who would eventually go on to found the company Bombardier. And I learned that when he was a child, he had repurposed old watches to create small wind-up motorboats and other novelties like that. And so I'd say my my curiosity in in timepieces was was deepened a little further at that time. Up until that point, to have to admit, uh, I had no idea of the distinction between uh, quartz and mechanical watches. They were all just sort of the same thing. Uh, so I suppose I should explain for anyone listening who might also not be familiar with this distinction between the two. Two watches that might otherwise look identical on the outside can be very different. Quartz watches are powered by batteries and they're regulated by tiny quartz crystals that vibrate tens of thousands of times a second. They're far and away the more commonly available type of watch that's manufactured today. Upwards of a, a billion uh, or some obscene number like that are produced every year, the majority of which are coming out of China. Mechanical watches, on the other hand, are, are powered and regulated by springs, and they've been around for hundreds of years. And if a mechanical watch is properly cared for, it will continue to tick away and do its job for hundreds more years. Uh, in fact, they're built in such a way that if you were to, say, find an, an old Rolex or an old Seiko in a, a landfill or something even older still, like an English or American-made pocket watch, you could have it brought back to looking and working just like new again by a competent watchmaker. So quartz watches have been around for just coming up close to 50 years now, uh, while mechanical watches, as I've mentioned, have been around for centuries. Uh, so back to Bombardier, that anecdote about repurposing uh, old watches intrigued me for years. I was just sort of simmering there in the back of my brain. And one of the first big purchases I can ever remember making, uh, so I saved up my paper route money and, and bought myself a Mickey Mouse watch. One day while, while playing with some other kids, someone stepped on my, my wrist and, and smashed the crystal, which is the glass that protects the front of the watch. Uh, so I seized the opportunity to take this broken watch to pieces. Uh, only I had no idea what I was doing, and what I found inside resembled absolutely nothing like what I had imagined Bombardier had encountered. And of course it wasn't, because it was a, a cheap quartz watch, uh, and quartz watches didn't exist when Bombardier was a kid. Uh, so the wonder uh, of what was ticking away inside a mechanical watch wasn't actually made known to me uh, until I, I read an article about Patek Philippe's Star Caliber 2000 around the turn of the millennium. And that featured several images showing off the incredible complexity of what was going on under its two dials. So it's a, a big pocket watch that has a face on the front of the watch and then a, a giant star chart on the back of the watch. With its, uh, I guess you could say it's animated, but it's all clockwork mechanisms that's turning the night sky. And also within the night sky, there's a moon that will wax and wane uh, in, in that sky as well. And that's just 
two of the myriad features uh, that this watch happens to have. You know, it'll tell you the time of sunrise and sunset, and it'll chime the time for you like a grandfather clock on these cathedral gongs that are inside the watch, and there's tons of neat little features like that. And all of it just packed into this pocket watch that's powered by springs, and uh, I was just smitten by that. Uh, so I was still in high school at this time, and to be honest, my professional ambition uh, at that time uh, was to be a cleanup animator at, at Disney. So I had a, a deep admiration for the work of, of Glenn Keane, who had animated Tarzan and the Beast and the Ariel from The Little Mermaid and the Eagle scene and the Rescuers Down Under, which remains one of my favorite scenes in, in animation. And I guess a, a bit of uh, overlap between the two of us again here. Something that really impressed me about him uh, was his understanding of the human body and kinematics of it all. So you had studied uh, human kinetics back in university and I had gone out of my way to take some kinesiology courses and whatnot to try and deepen my understanding of how the human body works for those purposes. Did you do a lot of drawing and, and art when you were a kid or what? Like, where, how close were you to actually getting into doing animating at that point? Were you doing a lot of drawing, a lot of sketching, that kind of thing at the time? Oh yeah, I was, I've been drawing for as long as I can remember, uh, like two or three years old and just all through elementary school and high school. Another thing that drew me to watchmaking is sort of the intersection of, of science and, and art uh, that it exudes. And uh, I put that into a better perspective. Uh, when I was graduating middle school, they gave out these awards, and I received uh, an award for science and an award for art. Art was always uh, was kind of an integral part of my childhood. I still still like to draw and paint and whatnot. So that's interesting because in my case, people always ask me about how artistic I was as a kid and assuming that I, because I do you know I make art now that I would have been it, despite wanting to be able to draw well as a kid I was never very artistic so it's I'm always intrigued by people who did that and then don't end up you know doing the the art that they were they were training in because most of the people I knew who were quite artistic like that as a kid they went on to then paint or illustrate or whatever it was that they were doing it's still something i do more as a hobby though and uh it's going back to the disney thing and, and glenn Keane and all that the quick loose heavy style in which he and, and other animators uh drew keyframes wasn't a skill that i considered myself to be highly proficient at uh, and neither was the work that the in-betweeners would do to chain the keyframes together so in animation you've got these guys will do the, the keyframes, another set of artists will link those all together, and then uh, another set of animators or the cleanup artists who go in uh, and fill in the details and make sure everything's seamless across all those frames. So that's what interested me. Some more the detailed, nitpicky side of the, the art, uh, less so the, the looser initial frames of the animation. So I was interested in making sure every detail was just right and that everything animated smoothly. Now, how far did you get along into starting that career? Like, did you actually start a, a school program? Like, did you go to college or university for, for something related to that? I did take some animation courses. Literally, the week that I started putting together my portfolio uh, to apply for the animation program at Sheridan College, uh, just outside of Toronto, which is one of the, the top animation schools, the artists from there have gone on to work at places like Disney and, and Pixar and, and Nickelodeon and all that sort of stuff. Um, actually, Weta Digital as well, who did pretty much all the visual effects for Lord of the Rings and, and The Hobbit. Quite a number of students from that program also ended up there. So yeah, the the week that I started putting my portfolio together to apply uh, for that program, Disney actually shut down its traditional 2D animation department. So all of a sudden there were dozens, if not hundreds of animators with 40 plus years experience under their belts without work and, and on the open market, so to speak. 3D animation was still an option, but I had, I had ruled out 3D animation early on in my pursuits because it didn't appeal to me in quite the same way. I didn't enjoy working in the software as much. And with, with a pretty little exception, the 3D animation at the time felt like it, it didn't have the same sort of soul to it that the 2D animation did. And waiting around for renders, even on a render farm, felt soul-sucking compared to the immediate feedback of, of pencil to paper. Uh, so I just kind of set set those ambitions aside. I should say, too, like uh, through all this, uh, I'd explored a, a number of different career options up till that point. I'd been introduced to the 
idea of job shadowing back in elementary school, which is basically where a student would spend a day following a professional in a given field of work. And I used that same basic framework to set up a number of opportunities to try my hand at, at different lines of work that were of some interest to me. And I owe a debt of gratitude to my mom as well for helping me set up a lot of these opportunities and, and make connections with professionals. So like animation was one of those things. Visual effects was another DNA sequencing, accounting, sculpting, woodwork, telecommunications, horticulture, among other things. And uh, watchmaking, of course, was one as well. However, it remained the only one of my curiosities throughout my youth that I wasn't able to satiate, as I was never able to find anyone who was practicing the craft. And anytime I tried to find someone, uh, I was always just, just ended up at dead ends. There weren't and there still aren't very many watchmakers around. And when a, a jewelry shop, which is the primary place that someone would bring a watch here here in Canada, when they found a watchmaker who was good, they guarded that like a closely held secret. And they, very rarely would they actually have a, be able to afford to have a watchmaker on site. They would be shipping the, the work to the watchmaker. Even if I could find a place that said they did watch repair, if I tried to somehow get in touch with their watchmaker, I'd be shut down, uh, which was discouraging. Uh, little did I know at the time, and I'd later come to learn that this whole means of exploring career opportunities is what Clay Christensen, who's the author of The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, advises doing in another one of his books. And it's also what design professors Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, who teach at Stanford, uh, they teach this the same the sort of principles in their uh, life design course at Stanford, uh, which is based on design thinking, because that allows you to prototype quickly with minimal sunk cost. So you can actually get a taste for whether you'd, you'd really enjoy something or not. Uh, so yeah, after a, a day of sequencing DNA on a lab, I realized, yeah, I, this, uh, you know, this is cool, but uh, I don't want to do this for 30 years. Needless to say, uh, I didn't end up pursuing a career in animation. Based on my portfolio of, of graphic and web design work, though I had managed to land an offer for a postgraduate course at Sheridan because I was like I was planning to apply there anyway I'll just apply for this other course instead of animation and that was in interactive multimedia design and which I ended up being accepted to and th the thought of being able to to skip my undergraduate studies and, and fast track into a, a fairly high level design career I found the, the thought of that kind of tantalizing but design work didn't feel like work uh, I could become so engrossed in the work during my summers off through high school that I easily drift into frequently working 16 to 18 hour days and pulling the occasional all-nighter, pulling the occasional series of all-nighters. And the, the tipping point came for me in my final year of high school uh, on the heels of two back-to-back all-nighters. I happened to fall asleep mid-sentence with a, a half-eaten donut in my hand while I was sitting and talking uh, with my friends at, at the Toronto Auto Show because I had agreed to go to the Toronto Auto Show with them. I had also just stayed up for two nights straight. So thankfully, I wasn't the one driving. Uh, someone else was, was driving. But that moment, or very shortly after that for me, I realized something I had to change. So the fear of sort of becoming so engrossed or absorbed in my work that I would fail to make quality time for family or friends, I found it somewhat terrifying. Uh, so I chose, in the end, not to take that offer from Sheridan because I wanted a job that didn't involve sitting in front of a computer all day. And that was probably influenced somewhat by the, the whole 3D versus 2D animation thing as well. I wanted a job that couldn't follow me home on a laptop. In this same window of time, a scholarship offer uh, came up out of the blue from the University of British Columbia. And I ended up spending a year studying in England through UBC. And during my time there, that's when I, I ended up deciding to pursue a career in watchmaking. Unfortunately, uh, I had no idea who George Daniels was at this time, and, and he was still alive. Uh, so I, I did not uh, seize the opportunity while I was there because I, I was just completely ignorant of the fact that, that he was alive and, and well there in the UK. During that time, he was difficult to actually get in touch with. Uh, everybody was trying to be his apprentice and, and trying to get in touch with him. And if there's a great documentary with... Roger Smith, who did end up becoming his apprentice. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. I believe it's just The Watchmaker's Apprentice. Yeah, I think it, you're right. It is The Watchmaker's Apprentice. It took him five or six years and a couple of watches before he was able to convince 
George to really give him the time of day. Yeah, somewhat ironically as well, where I was studying was Hurst Sioux, which was the former Royal Observatory after Greenwich. And that is actually the, the same observatory that Daniels had all the watches that he had tested uh, at an observatory for, for chronometric standards. That would all happen at, at Hurst Sioux. Uh, so my my time there I actually learned quite a bit about astronomy and Britain's watchmaking and, and clockmaking legacy. Got to spend a bunch of time at the Greenwich Museum as well. The Worshipful Company of Clockmakers, which is the the clock and watchmakers guild that's been around for centuries, has this incredible museum in London. And of course, while I was in England, I, I popped around to pretty much any watchmaker I could find to try and learn a little bit more. I d- didn't get too far there with that either i was able to learn tidbits more but not a whole lot Uh, that's kind of the period of time when i first learned what an escapement was figured out what jewels in a watch are which are essentially just ruby donuts that the pivots of gears uh run in now did you find that it was difficult to get in with watchmakers because they just didn't want you around like they didn't want to show what they were doing what was what was the difficulty in in finding people who were willing to sort of sit down and show you what they were doing? I'd say the difficulty was finding a watchmaker who thoroughly understood the craft and was like actually a, a watchmaker. They would call themselves watch jobbers in the UK. So those are primarily the, the kind of people I would, in, I would encounter. So they would be doing quartz movement swaps and battery changes and crystal changes and things like that. So not really getting into the nitty gritty of taking a mechanical movement to pieces and restoring it or making replacement parts like a balance staff or a winding stem. I guess the equivalent in the car world would be the difference between a place that just does oil changes versus a full on mechanic. That's a good analogy. Like I didn't stumble across the watchmakers who were working at Asprey and in Piccadilly Circus guys like speak Marin and, and whatnot yeah i never encountered any any watchmakers executing it at that level the same held true when when i returned back to canada but i was dead set on tr- finding someone to to teach me when i arrived uh, back in canada the following summer uh, so i was based in vancouver that summer so uh, i looked up watch repair in the yellow pages which is a phone book for those who may have never heard of such a thing <laughs> I like to refer to it as a, it's an outdated Google search. <laughs> that's a, that's a, an apt way to, to put it. So I, I traipsed all around the city. I knocked on every single door of someone who, who said that they, they worked with watches. Of all of them, just a little over a dozen places. I'd say three of them worked with mechanical watches, maybe four. I can't recall precisely offhand. This was, this was years ago now. And of them, only one of them was willing to to take me on in in any sense to to sort of show me the ropes some of it was space constraints some of that was due to the fact that uh, because the, there's such a disparity of supply and demand for watchmakers some of them were just swamped in work and didn't have time to sort of coach someone or, or take on an apprentice or, or what have you but anyway this one fellow who was willing to take me on wanted to charge me a few hundred dollars a week to <laughs> to teach me Whereas, look, I, was, I had been hoping that this would actually be more like a, you know, a little side job I could do while I was doing my university studies at, at UBC. Uh, so being a student, already getting set to pay tuition for the coming year, uh, didn't really make sense. Like, I, I couldn't come to terms with paying someone a couple hundred dollars a week to teach me, especially when he wanted to, to start me on quartz pieces. So around that same time, I discovered there was one school left in Canada that's still taught craft of of watchmaking and the tuition there for an entire year was something like seven hundred dollars i can't remember the precise figure it was less than a thousand bucks for the the entire year so it was was a no-brainer rather than pay someone a few hundred dollars a week for just a few hours a week i could go full-time studies full set of equipment at my fingertips instructors who were dedicated just to teaching, not working on their own pieces and and kind of teaching me little tidbits here and there. So I uh, decided to take a leap of faith, uh, headed out east from from Vancouver, and I found myself at L'École Nationale d'Horlogerie in uh, the middle of of Quebec. And that's essentially how I I came to begin my career. I really wish that I had known about that when I was younger. If I had known... uh 
you know, I think we've discussed this a few times, but if I'd known about a program like that in my early 20s, I probably would have gone and I probably would have taken a very different path to to getting to where I am today. Hmm. Yeah, it was, I'm very grateful to have come upon it because, it, I mean, the tools really are so specialized and the skills you've got to hone, it's really hard to do it. It's not impossible, but it's difficult to do it uh, of your own accord and it would be quite costly to acquire all the different tools. From there, uh, I worked at a museum uh, right out of school. And then from there, went worked at Swatch Group's headquarters here in Canada, uh, working primarily with Tissot and Omega, but also having the odd Ratto or, or Longines and, and other pieces across my bench, uh, and even the occasional Blancpain, things like that. And then from there, uh, off to Rolex, and then eventually settled here in Ottawa. And that's the nice thing uh, as well. As when I was first researching the craft, uh, I discovered that as a watchmaker, you can pretty much choose to live in, in any city you want and you'd be able to, to find work. So it was a, a nice upside as well. And there are various stats and things that I had read back when I was sussing things out during my time in England and just seeing the incredible shortage uh, of skilled watchmakers around the world. Yeah, I do recommend that anyone who's out there who's trying to figure out what they want to do for school or they know someone who's trying to figure out what they want to do for school if they're at all mechanically inclined uh, or they think they might be looking into becoming a watchmaker is certainly an excellent idea there, there's a huge demand for for watchmakers so if you're out there and you're you're thinking about it uh you're thinking about starting a career and and you think it might be something you're interested in seriously look into it because it is uh it is certainly something that uh, that the world is in need of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. So, John, over the years, uh, you've mentioned that you lived in fin Finland for a little while. Uh, mm. What got you over there? And tell us a little bit about your experience there. I'm the oldest of four kids, and my mom was full-time at home with us for most of my childhood. Uh, she worked a little bit here and there uh, as an accountant. Having four kids on one income, we, we didn't travel much uh, for vacations and things like that. So I had this this unsatiated travel bug uh, that just sort of stuck with me through my childhood. So I wanted to, to get out and see the world. Uh, so my first opportunity, or at least what I thought was an opportunity, was a summer program at Oxford. And I applied for that, got accepted, and then in filling out the more detailed paperwork, got rejected because I was too young for their, their cutoff age which I wish had been made more clear so I didn't go through all the wasted energy of, of applying for that. So anyway, the next opportunity that presented itself for me to, to study abroad was through a local rotary club uh, in the city I was, was living in at the time. And through a long series of interviews, the country that I was assigned was Finland, and that was based on where they thought I would be best suited. Uh, and it turns out they were they were quite right. I Really enjoyed my time in Finland, made some lifelong friends there, and I just found that the way of life there jives with a lot of what, what I value as well. I mean, to put it into a, a bit of perspective, cell phones were, weren't as popular as, as they are now, but Nokia is based in, in Finland, and Finland being a relatively small country, it was actually law that you had to have a cell signal no matter where you were in the country. So I was... So walking through the forest one afternoon, felt like the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden I hear this phone ringing, and this fellow I was hiking with pulls this cell phone out of his pocket and, and answers it and takes a cell phone call, which to me at the time was kind of mind-boggling. And I just really appreciated the balance that the Finnish people have for sort of nature uh, as well as cutting-edge technology, because back then Nokia was the, the cutting-edge cell phone. Like if you wanted a nice cell phone, you, you got a Nokia. That's not the case anymore. Nokia has gone through a number of rebirths or reimagining of, of what it is and what it does. I mean, they started with tires and boots and eventually went on to sell cell phones and who knows what they'll move on to next. And I also really appreciate the just sort of the detailed nature of most Finnish people. It's very methodical. And then there, there's this Finnish word Sisu, which uh, there isn't a direct translation for in any other language, but uh, it just essentially means great strength in the, the face of adversity. And I found that to be quite admirable as well. Uh, so I spent the year there in Finland, one of the best school years of my life, because uh, 
I didn't have a, a set curriculum. I basically got to pick and choose. And I really admire the Finnish schooling system, uh, which I've come to learn later on after the fact. It's rated among uh, one of the best in the world. But they're very hands-on, uh, very craft-oriented. They take really good care of their students. I mean, the meals and things are, are provided. Uh, the way they break up the school year is quite unique. But I was able to take courses in woodworking, metalsmithing. I, I took a knife-making course while I was there. Uh, in the art department, the art teacher just basically gave me free reign to do whatever I, I wanted or, or chose to pursue. Great music courses, language courses, math courses, the works. Uh, you know, picked up a bit of Russian, a bit of German while I was there too. Um, and because there's five semesters... Oh, at least there was when I was there. I don't know if things have changed, uh, but there are five semesters in the school year. Uh, they actually have quite a variety of courses you can choose from throughout the course of a year. And so there's quite a lot of change. Uh, and you can fast track too. So if you want to specialize in something, you take that course every single semester uh, and you can really begin to excel and, and specialize in various fields uh, or just take little snippets of anything and everything just to see what, what interests you. I uh, really enjoyed my time there. And uh, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal year of schooling. So we've talked a lot so far about the watchmaking side of what you're doing, as well as the artistic background that you have. But on top of those things, you're also an app developer. How, how did you get into developing software? And, you know, I guess we'll talk a bit about what you do. Like you're developing a couple of iOS apps specifically for the watch industry. And is that where you started? You know, have you developed on other platforms? Tell us a bit about that. In terms of programming, my first encounter with a computer was when my dad brought home an old XT that had been decommissioned from work. Don't remember exactly how old I was, but it was in the, the single digits. And uh, it had an amber monochrome display, uh, literal floppy disks. The hard drive was also in the single digits of megabytes. And uh, I remember it had 128 kilobytes of RAM as well. And I remember that because I, I can still distinctly remember the sound of the RAM counting up every time I, I rebooted the computer. Um, there's some games on it, but they primarily consisted of moving ASCII art around on the screen. Uh, so within a few weeks, uh, I'd beaten all the games on the machine multiple times. I didn't have a modem, so it wasn't connected to the internet. So I just would poke around and experiment on it. So my first introduction to actual programming, I would say, came about experimenting with batch files to automate tasks on the, the command line and, and create rudimentary user interfaces using essentially overly complex echo statements. And as I grew older, uh, I continued to learn more sophisticated languages, primarily to solve problems or save time doing repetitive tasks or to perform the occasional game mod. Just effectively to get the computer to do something that I, I wanted it to do. Eventually, we got a 2400 baud modem, still not connected to the World Wide Web, but I could dial into the, the occasional BBS bulletin board system that I discover or learn about. Spent a ridiculous amount of time on the local library's dial-up connection, just looking at their, their catalog, which was novel to me. I spent tons of time in the library as a kid. Anytime I had problem or something I, w I wanted to learn. I would just pick up the most suitable language to achieve that. So whether that was dabbling in some HTML, you know, starting with tables and whatnot, eventually getting to cascading style sheets and a dynamic HTML and then Flash came along. Uh, I did quite a bit of action script in Flash and developed some different things doing that. And uh, interestingly, Flash has like, officially received its death blow. I was going to say, the uh, Adobe just uh, issued the death sentence for that. It's dying, I think, in 2020, which I can't believe they're still going to drag it out for another two and a half years. But <laughs> anyway. Well, I think essentially what happened with Flash is, is that it was so powerful compared to what you could do in, in terms of what it could access down in, in the hardware uh, that there was really no other way when it first came out to do the similar things, just using JavaScript or HTML and, and all that, or Java even to some extent. Uh, so I mean, you could access the camera, microphone, you could do all sorts of nifty things, but that became a, a vector for exploitation. Well, that and it was 
horribly inefficient. It's one of those things that so many people started relying on it for their website and they were taking advantage of the fact that people were getting more and more memory in their machines. But with the advent of so much mobile browsing, there was no way those mobile devices at the time were going to be able to support Flash effectively. And people had built these websites on it and it was just never going to to support the the phones and, and be a, a good user experience. And by that point, there were so many better technologies out. So yeah, I'm not I'm not sad that Apple effectively decided to to kill it off by not supporting it at all on iOS. I think that was one of the better things that's happened to the uh, the web in the last ten years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Steve Jobs' letter on on Flash back in 2010 was I'd say the first blow. Yeah, I've learned other languages, you know, PHP and and whatnot to do some some server side scripting and JavaScript when needed. Uh, I learned some C plus plus Java itself odd bit of C programming. I even did a little bit of machine level coding in, in hex. So I guess really a lot of the programming is self-taught and designed as a, or taught to yourself as a, a way to solve the various problems that you were coming into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All, all self-taught. Any courses I, I took in school, I would generally wind up frustrated and just kind of do my own thing in the class and, and move ahead. So when did you start developing for iOS? Essentially as soon as I could. I still had a power PC when the SDK was first announced. So I, I couldn't dive in right away. Bought myself uh, an Intel-based Mac as soon as I could. And then from there, just started tinkering and working away at it. I would say I learned quite a bit from CS193P, which is a Stanford course. That was taught by two Apple engineers. Phenomenal job teaching the course and, and sort of teaching you the ropes. Uh, so that that was, I'd say, what sort of rocketed my learning. I ended up, uh, my first app relied actually quite a bit on um, Objective-C++, sort of bridging Objective-C and C++, because I was doing some, some lower level audio processing that was not as simple to do on the older iOS back then iPhone OS, as it is to do now with a lot of the more native things that are, are available to us for digital signal processing to analyze the ticking of a watch. So your first applications that you were developing then were for for your watchmaking then? Yeah. When the iPhone first came out, I mean, myself, like so many other people, I had all sorts of ideas for things you'd love to see on, on that display. Because you effectively had a piece of glass that you could put anything you wanted onto, anything you could dream up, uh, and you had the ability to interact with it directly. Interesting crossover there as well. When I was in Finland, they released their first, uh, I don't know if it was the first camera phone, but they released a, a camera phone that was essentially all screen and had this keyboard that was slide out. And when I first saw that it was like 2002 2003 i was like you know what someday i would love a phone that is just all screen like that and just give me a software keyboard and then lo and behold a few years later apple delivered so i had dozens of ideas of what i wanted to see on it but one of the things was having a timing machine there were things you could do where you could have a computer hooked up to a watch and be able to do some timing that way and there's dedicated equipment to it that's professional grade The iPhone was announced before I graduated from watchmaking school. And then the SDK came out within the first year that I was working. And so it wasn't really within my means to be able to buy a dedicated piece of hardware to time watches on. I knew what it would take to time a watch and how that would need to be analyzed in terms of interpreting the audio. So I just kind of dreamed a little something up. And to be honest, what I had dreamed up, I still haven't fully executed on. Still got plenty of little point notes for areas I would like to improve and work on that. But the nice thing about it is popping a phone up on my watchmaking bench at home, as opposed to having a full out computer beside me, uh, it was just a, a much nicer user experience. Yeah. But you do say, so you say that you you still have things to work on in that, uh, to realize that application. But having said that, you do still have a perfectly functioning app available in the app store yes, right now, yeah. correct? For rate analysis. There's all sorts of other things that you can analyze about the, the ticking of a timepiece and all sorts of, yeah, there, there's a lot more that could be done that I'd like to do, but haven't gotten around to yet. 
I mean, part of the, my reasoning for developing at that time too was I was getting into, I was going to get into the weeds here a little bit, but dynamically poising mechanical watches. So try to get the rate as close to zero as possible while making modifications to the balance wheel while it's actually running in the watch. So analyzing that and the timing machines I had access to, the, the dedicated professional grade stuff was only good to within an accuracy of a single second. And some of the adjustments I was doing, I wanted sub-second level analysis. So that's one of the features that I made one of my, my primary goals for that initial app was to have sub-second accuracy once you were within 10 seconds. And using that, I was able to get uh, a number of watches regulated incredibly well. Funny enough, little did I know that customer support for this app would eventually lead me to develop another app that has proven to be even more valuable in achieving this goal because it actually analyzes real world use of the watch, not isolated measurements in a clean, pristine environment, but actually taking measurements from the watch itself while it's being worn in day-to-day -day use, noting trends there, and then being able to make small adjustments based on those trends. Uh, I've been able to get a little over a dozen watches now to essentially keep perfect time. So a mechanical watch that is almost on every single reading at, at 0, 0.0 seconds a day, of deviation. You might get the occasional 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 seconds per day, but they are more or less for the person who's wearing them tuned to their, their daily wearing habits. My second app uses the camera rather than the mic to analyze the, the rate. And for people who are interested, the two apps are Kello and Twixt. That's correct. Yeah. And Kello is actually the, the Finnish word for clock. Uh, my my play there was just on the sort of master clocks that a, a lot of watchmakers would have used back in the day for timing watches. So before the advent of timing machines, you would have one incredibly well-regulated clock, sometimes kept in a, a vacuum-sealed chamber uh, that would be running in the workshop, and that's what they would time all their watches by. So you'd, you'd make a, an adjustment, set the watch aside for a day, and compare it to the master clock the following day, and then make another adjustment as needed. So it's quite a tedious and long process. Uh, but using timing machines, you can make similar adjustments in a matter of minutes rather than days because you're able to extrapolate out over time how the watch is going to perform. You say that there's a lot of uh, a lot of features that you're still interested in implementing into these applications. And I'm sure we'll go into a lot more depth in this in the future. Anything you want to talk about that uh, you're sort of working on now, the problems that you're trying to solve right now? Without going into too much detail, because I wouldn't want to pre-announce anything or, or bite off more than I can chew. been dabbling in some machine learning and, and computer vision, primarily on the computer vision side of things, for Twixt over the last year and a half or so. I've been making some interesting progress there that just makes it more of a joy to use. It just takes care of, of some of the tedium right now of having to register the, the positions of various dial elements when you, you take a snapshot. So the way Twix essentially works uh, is it's tied to NTP servers, which serve up precise time from atomic time sources. And the instant that you take a photo of the dial of a watch or clock, it registers that alongside the current precise time. And then over time, by tracking the, the movement of the, the hands, which are input and confirmed by the person using the app, it's able to measure the, the deviation over time. So I've been making some good progress getting the app to automatically register the various components of the dial. So it's just quicker to input. Then eventually we'd like to get to the point where it can just, you know, single tap and takes care of everything for you. There's some minimal oversight. Well, good. I, I know I've used it a little bit on, on a few of my own watches and you were talking earlier about a master clock. I'm I'm in the process of starting a chronometer for my own shop and building one so that I've got an accurate timepiece to to sort of work from. Uh, more as a tradition than anything else, since as you say, modern timekeeping uses you know NTP servers and atomic clocks that are far more accurate than these mechanical ones. But uh, I know I know Twix is certainly something that I've used. So I look forward to chatting a little bit more about that. All right. Well, thanks very much for your introduction into your backstory, John. I, I know that we'll be discussing a lot of these things more in the future and 
uh, digging deeper into some of the application programming as well as some of the watchmaking. So we'll uh, we'll leave that for another episode, though. All right. Well, it's, it's been nice chatting some more, Chris. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore Hand. <laughs>